Greetings in the name of Jesus. It's a blessing to be here this morning. Thankful to be here. Glad to see everyone. Um, appreciated all the thoughts shared and um, the comments and just just glad and thankful and blessed to be here. We stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and this time that you have given us. We ask that you would bless us and encourage us that we can pursue your kingdom, press into your kingdom, be there and for you. We need your help and we thank you for all the blessings you have given us. Bless each one here and just be with us. In the name of Jesus, amen. I like that thought. Uh, the Lord is to be trusted. Yeah, he's worthy to be trusted. Uh, my thought was, on whose side are you on? Whose side are we striving for? And I, I would trust that all of us would say, we're striving for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. But God has been God of all the universe and all the people, but most people don't serve Him. And... Uh, there, there's this danger of, of us falling away and there's this danger of us becoming tired and weak and, and we've been encouraged already that we, we encourage one another we, we, need to, we need to do that whenever we have the chance whenever we can we don't have a, we don't have the longest time to live uh, the other day I had the thought that if the time is short for Satan, that must mean our time is short too. I'm thinking about the revelation that so he's going to make war with those that are left behind because he knows that his time is short. And how much shorter is our time than 2,000 years? It's, uh... So I was going to try and make... Uh, can I use different examples of at the same people that live at the same time um, in um, there's Abel and then there's Cain the one this would be in Genesis 4 um Just a big difference of outcome in how we respond to God, how we respond to um, it's just I think like Buddy will said, there's an actual thing, if I understood him correctly, like how do we how we, how do we act this out in the flesh? And so in in Genesis 4, 3, it says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, for his part, brought of the first things of his flock, their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offerings. But for Cain and his offerings, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Isn't this so natural in our... You know, I, I don't know if all of, any of us have come to the place where our countenance cannot fall. Like something happens and we're kind of... Uh, maybe some of us have come to the place where we just go right through that and we, we don't, it doesn't affect us. That's where, we need to, that's where we need to press to be. And, but here Cain's countenance fell and... He, 
And this is one of my favorite verses on the simplicity of how God talks to people. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Why are you, why are you depressed? Why have you given up? Why are you discouraged? If you do well, will you not be accepted? So, won't we be accepted if we do well? Can we not trust? Is there not something in us that that we feel well if we if we um, if we do well? We we feel good. We feel well. If you do, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. It's desires for you, but you must master it. This was instruction from God's mouth to Cain. He didn't. He disobeyed God. He did not listen to God's counsel. He did not accept God. Right after that, some, or the next day, or, it just says Cain said to his brother Abel, "Let's go out in the field." Um, I wasn't going to, going to get into that. Um, then there's Isaac. There's probably many more. But then there's Isaac and uh, Ishmael. Isaac was a son of promise. Ishmael was born before. Ishmael was born to uh, Abraham before Isaac. But he was the son from a slave woman. He was not the son of promise. And so after Ishmael was born, God told Abraham plainly that this is not the son of this is not the son you're looking for. And uh, and Isaac was then the son of promise and he he had he had something that Ishmael didn't have. Uh, I think it's Ishmael that was said that his hand would be against the hand of everybody else, and everybody else's hand would be against his hand. And we, that's still going today. If you need any evidence of something that has stood for, not the only thing that stood for this long, but one other thing that stood for this long, this is still happening today. Jacob would be another one I thought of. He was blessed, even though in some of our minds it seems like he got blessed in a wrong way, but he got blessed. And the heritage went through him up to Christ, not through Esau. There's other things about that that I don't understand, like Jacob I have hated and Esau. Sorry. Esau I have hated and Jacob I have loved even before they were born. Um, and Esau missed his blessing even though he was the oldest son. He was born first. They were, they were twins. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It seems like this pattern has also been in the Old Testament to some degree, quite often. Like there'd be blessings from people that shouldn't have had blessings, and then people that should have been blessed were cursed. Disobey it, basically. And in all these examples, these men had the ability and the freedom of will to obey. God. I thought of David and Saul. Saul would have been first. He was chosen by God to be king over Israel. And he was humble. God could use him. But then he disobeyed. And 
when we disobey God, we have to expect consequences, either in this life or the life to come. In this case, he was, his kingdom was taken from him because he disobeyed God. He did not find God worthy to be trusted, so he disobeyed him. I think that one time, maybe it was the last time, I'm not quite sure, like there's this big army gathering against him. And Samuel had told him, you wait until we do sacrifice before God. But Samuel didn't, sh didn't show up. I think God intended it that way for a test. He didn't show up. He didn't. I, Robert, I know how many days he didn't show up. I can't remember. But seven days. So he, and this army was gathering against him. And he was afraid. He was scared. And so finally he did sacrifice himself. Then who showed up? The prophet, Samuel. And it was not good. When we disobey God, we should expect that there's going to be consequences. On the other hand, we can say David wasn't a perfect man either, but he was a man after God's own heart. He pressed on into God. He did not, he did not turn away from God. He kept pressing into it, even though he had some very serious consequences he took from being disobedient. For that matter, Moses took great consequences for being disobedient to God. God told him to, I think, maybe speak to the rock. And he hit the rock. And because of that, he was not allowed to go into Canaan. God took him up on a high, on a high mountain. He, looked, he could see Canaan, but he never was allowed to go into it. Because he disobeyed. So David, he, that one time, they had been out on, they, they did these kind of things back then, went out on, on uh, hunting trips against men, destroying the ungodly, I guess. I, I don't quite fully understand all that, why that had to be that way, but. I want to take it that we need to destroy the ungodly in our, in our souls. Anything that's not good in our souls, we need to destroy it, get rid of it. So David was out with his men, 400 men, I think, maybe 600. The women, the children, and we're all in one place. And another raiding army comes along and takes all these children, all their animals, everything they had. Took it off, took it away. So back then, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have walkie-talkies, they didn't even have cars, they didn't have tanks. They walked or rode horses. Horses were probably the fastest things they had. I don't, it doesn't, maybe it does say, I can't remember if it says how many, how long, um, how long a time it went until they finally got back home or back to their camp. And everybody was gone. And these, I can't remember the names, but the, this raiding army had taken everything away. And the men, instead of standing behind David, said, we're thinking of stoning David because they were so upset. They were just, they were depressed. They were, they couldn't, they couldn't hardly take it. So they thought of killing David, their very leader. And this is another favorite of mine, what he said. I don't know if any of you remember, but, and I don't, I'm not sure I can quote it exactly, but something to the effect of um, he strengthened himself in the Lord and asked God what to do. He strengthened himself. Everybody was against him. His family was gone. His wives were gone. His children were gone. It looked like um, like there was no hope. 
These are tests I think David went through. God was testing David. He tested him many times. It almost appears to me like Saul he put in there, he looked like a good man, he put him in there. But it turned out that he wasn't very good. So before he put David in there, he tested him and tested him and tested him. I feel like kind of severely. And most of those tests, he, he came through with shining example. Like here, he strengthened himself in the Lord. And then he asked God what to do. Or maybe he asked whether he should go after them. I, I can't remember. But then was, and was he went in after this whole army. And they overtook him. And I guess either chased him off or killed him. I'm not sure what all happened to him. All. But they got everything back. Everything that they took off with, they got it back. The wives, their children, their animals, their tents. They got everything back. And they like it even more. They also probably got, took back what others had. So this is a man after God's own heart. Are we on that side? Or are we on Saul's side? Are we on Jacob's side, being blessed? Or are we on Esau's side? Are we on Isaac's side? Are we on the side of promise? Or are we from the slave woman? Or I missed uh, Noah. Uh, Noah was... Uh, in Genesis 6, 8. Sorry. No. Yeah, this is 6, 8. So, but no one found favor in the sight of God. Then it goes through the descendants in 9 and 10. Uh, and Noah had three sons. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. The earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I'm going to destroy them along with, earth, with the earth. Um, so God found favor, or Noah found favor in the sight of God. Does this just happen? No, it just, just happened to be. There's nothing that Noah did. Um, it says Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. This is what, this is what we have to do. Or we can be like this. Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw the wickedness of the mankind was great in the earth and every inclination and thought to their heart were only evil continually. And the, earth, and the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on earth and grieved him in his heart. They would not allow God to strive with them anymore. I think we very subtly that happens to us has happened to some among us already, can happen to us. This is why we need to be awake and this is why we need to encourage one another continually to press on into the heavenly kingdom. There is nothing else. So again, on whose side are we on? 
in a lot of these cases, we will find a few righteous people and many unrighteous. Now, like in the case of Abel and Cain, there's only two, but um, in the case of Noah, it was like, let's see, one, two, yeah, it was eight souls versus millions. In Jesus' time, they all forsook him and fled. He was, except the one that was tied to the, or nailed to the cross beside him, couldn't flee away. Never had this thought before, but if somebody was just turned him loose and sat him there and said, okay, deny Christ or leave, I wonder if he would have fled, given the opportunity. I don't know. We, we're pretty weak. We, we need to be humble. I would tend to think maybe he wouldn't. I don't know. It's something we don't know. Uh, so this one thief was there with him when he died, giving him support, or a little bit of support. All the rest were fled away or were against him. That's right. Yeah, I, I got something about the scripture that says all left for certain. But, uh, that's why I'm not going to let the degree. There's an end there too, I think. So, yeah, but let's. You know, I. I like Peter. It's also one of those cases where um, he forsook him. He didn't stand with him, but I, I guess I couldn't. I couldn't recommend anybody to forsake Christ and think maybe get a second chance. Um, we tend to think Peter never really forsook him, but he denied him. I don't know if we, we need to be. I just don't think it's a very safe thing to do to deny the Lord. Uh, that's in God's hands. I don't know. Um, some more of those mysteries that God has. So on which side are we on? Are we pressing on with our whole hearts and pursuing um, in Romans 14? Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. He's actually talking about uh, Yeah, maybe I'll just leave. He, he's talking about judging one another, about food and, and other things. I wasn't intending to. This verse, uh, let us pursue what makes peace and for mutual upbuilding. I could just read a few more. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for you to make others fall by what you eat. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. Just some strong, I feel, I always felt like it was a strong admonition to us 
to be careful that we don't exploit our liberties that we have. Like the other scripture that says we should um, live peace with, with men, all men as much as lies within us, as much as we can, as much as we can muster up there. We need to live peaceably with men. Um, On the other side, John 1, 2. This is a warning to us. Do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. Like Dwayne said, we can... Can we say to the world that we're not, even though we're going to get slain, even though we're going to lose our lives, what do we care? Because if we love the world, we cannot be of his. For all that is in the world, and the desire of the flesh, and the desire of the eyes, and the pride and riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires, desires pass away, and those who do not, those who do the will of God live forever. It's quite a contrast. But the world has to offer it's just going to disappear. It's just, we're going to die, or some other country takes over, or anything we might have just can be gone as a vapor, even our own lives. Our lives are not sure. We don't know if we'll live the rest of the day. This thing of this earth is passing away. But those who do the will of God live forever. The God is to be trusted. The Lord is to be trusted. The difference is great whether we trust God or whether we start doing things our own way. First Timothy six eleven. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. We don't maybe should read what he's talking about that we should shun. these duties, whoever teaches otherwise and does not agree with the sound, doc, sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that is in accordance with godliness and is conceited understanding nothing has a morbid craving for controversy and for disputes about the words about words from these come envy and dissension, slander base suspicions these are things he's talking about. Um, as for you, man of God, shun all of this. Is this something that's still around? I think it is. Something we need to fight against? It is. We're not out of this life yet. For controversy, for disputes about words, from these come envy, dissension, slander, base suspicions, and wrangling among those who are depraved in mind and bereft of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Of course there's great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing to the world so that we can take nothing out of it. That would be another way of saying 
that all of this is going to pass away. We're not going to take anything with us unless it's going to be doing the will of God. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. For those who want to be rich fall into temptation or trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. People that have accepted Christ and were walking in his ways says, in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through with many pains. This is when it says, but as for you, man of God, shun all of this. And instead of, instead of doing this, what I just read, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and doings, gentleness, fight the good faith of faith, hold, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you were made, for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. This encouragement that I guess Paul gave to Timothy. And he's talking to godly people. He's talking to the people of God to keep us godly, to keep us from falling away. Sometimes the simplicity of the gospel is so easy to understand that we just tend to miss it. We start adding things like in Galatians, they had taken Christ by faith and then they started adding stuff to it. And he said, Who has bewitched you? Why do you think that you can make something better than faith in God? I think maybe he's talking specifically about Old Testament things, but I don't think it would stop there. When we take a hold of, of Christ and we pursue him, we give our life and soul to him, we forsake the world, we embrace and pursue righteousness and holiness. We love our enemies. Um, lost my train there. But uh, so, why were we? Lost it, but I'm thinking what I was saying this for, but as Christians, we need to pursue these things, and and we have this liberty to choose to be on the side of the of like Abel. He brought us. He doesn't give much information, but he brought us in sincerity. He wanted to serve God. He had something hidden somewhere, and God told him, um, well, yeah, he had something hidden enough to where he, his coming and fell. And, and God told him, if he does well, will he not be accepted? So this is, this is the thing we can weigh out on.
Like Noah, he was involved with God. And like Isaac, he was a son of promise. He, he, he could have disobeyed too. I don't think he was forced to be the son of promise. He was forced to be Isaac, I guess, if you will. But he could have went. He could, we can choose to do whatever we want to anybody we want. Unless we get put in jail or in stocks or something or God kills us. There's many people who have done very wickedly to many people. And God just didn't just bring judgment on their head immediately. But there will be a judgment for all those things. And so we're at liberty too. But we can also be unkind and, and short-tempered and whatever else that we struggle with. Um, at different times through, through the days as we go. I mean, I just think we'll get tested. And if we don't learn to also forgive, I don't think we have a very good chance of serving God. I mean, it's very clear that if we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. But it's just the fact that I'm, I'm sure all of you had to forgive me for things. And I know God had to forgive me of things. And I know my family especially had, had many things to forgive me for. And I, there's, there's just the more contact you have, the more you have to learn to, there's just things going to happen. Without forgiveness, maybe we end up like Cain and, and God has to say, well, if you do well, don't you be accepted? Then we can choose to go on and do it our way or we can listen to God. I was just thinking, I think something got mentioned about the day where I think maybe Joe mentioned about the days we live in, or the day we live in, we have grace uh, is sufficient for that day. And, and I noticed in Peter 3.13, Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? Those who are doing or think that they are doing God's good. They'll do your harm. Yes. And some other greedy people too. But they were eager to do good. I, I was thinking about this virus a little bit. I um, mean, I think all of us do, and uh, surely sometimes at least. Maybe some of us have forgotten it, I don't know. But it's, uh, it's, it's nothing to fear if we're prepared to die. Um, I just like the encouragements. When I hear these encouragements, that we don't need to live in fear of these things like the world does. They're afraid that something bad's going to happen. But something bad is going to happen. Everybody's going to come to judgment. We're all going to lose everything. But what is given in Christ and put in storage and the treasures that we've stored up in heaven. And if we think we've got a big power storage up there, we might have to guess again. I, just a thought I had, I never thought of this before, but I, I would think that could be pride involved in that. And I would probably, just off my mind, off the top of my head, I'd say, don't think that you've got a big pal up there waiting for you. Just pursue doing righteousness. Continue on doing what is just. God takes care of that treasure. We, we, don't, we don't take care of it, actually. We don't put it there and we don't take it away. Well, I guess we can take away a treasure in heaven by doing evil. So I think I would like to encourage us all to not fear. Who, now who will harm you if you're eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. 
but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned or you sadly, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will. I kind of I just caught that this last time. If suffering should be God's will. Not everybody suffers all the time. Sometimes I think people go through life as Christians and they never really faced horrible persecution. I think maybe many people don't. Some do. Many do. Many have. We need to be prepared to suffer. If suffering should be God's will, then to suffer for doing evil. The evil men suffer too, more so than some of us have been protected quite a bit from a lot of, at least some of those evil things. But we can very easily observe the jails are full of people. What are they full for? What, what have they done? Were they being kind? Were they being helpful? Were they giving service to other people and they got put in the jail? Well, that can happen, but normally what we see in jail is not, not that way. There's a few, even a few in this country, that from time to time that have suffered unright, uh, un wrongly. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, righteous, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, and in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. Bless you all. That's all I have. And um, just hope that we can continue pressing on into this kingdom that is spiritual, but we somehow play it out in the flesh now. The time is coming when it's going to be all spiritual, I think. Best I can tell. None of us have been there, but. I believe we'll all be there one day. So let's make use of our time the best we can. God bless you. Feel free to share. Thanks for the message, Walter. I, w I was thinking about the, uh, the part about um, not adding to or, or having, having distractions or uh, anything that would that would keep you from the pure, pure message of, of God. And uh, well, Jesus said, like, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all else will be added unto you. And then uh, that you must be born again, like, to, to, accept, to accept his message as a little child and I could think about so many people that, that would be out on the streets that I'd interact with and you know I might see the evangelists that have their cars all decked out in some kind of a message but usually it's it's like intermingled and mixed with with like a worldly perception you know if he says my kingdom is not of this earth if it were my people would fight for me and yet yet the very people that are out there to witness have like the American flag posted all over their cars and uh, think that self-defense is okay and 
Um, that the the main emphasis is is that you must be saved. You must be saved, and that surely, if you are trying to pursue God at all, then 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 you must not be saved. Like if you cannot have this defining moment of salvation, then then surely you're not you're not walking after God. But where where would we get these perceptions? Because we don't see that in Christ's word. Like so many times through the Gospels do you see do, act, follow. But we but is it is it just the backgrounds that we come from or like the, the preconceived conceptions that we have? Like when we came to the act of baptism into the faith, did we actually sacrifice everything that we needed to sacrifice? Or do we still have this this extra perception there? Did we truly die to our old selves? Or did we set, accept somebody else's explanation for what the gospel needed to be defined as? So I just, I just, I really appreciate the sentiment of like just simply accepting Christ's words, not having to explain away anything, but just accepting it for what it says. So little confusion is there when you can just come to it as a little child and not add anything to it. I just let God work. God bless you all. And thank you, Brother Walt, to so many profound points. One, I'm st- so maybe a brother could give a lesson sometime on on testing. You know, uh, testing, and well, some people are tested a lot stronger than others, and some appear that they're never tested, but we know that God chastens all those who He loves, and all those who, well, all those will be tested. I mean, how could you hear, well done, faithful servant, well done, faithful servant, if there wasn't some testing? There's obedience, of course, but that's that's a tough one that... Only God can, I guess, sort through. Abraham, uh, he's going to direct his family. I know him and all that. Then he was tested rough. Uh, Paul was told by Ananias, I'm going to show him how many things he'll suffer for my name's sake. I'm sure that when we were all baptized or when we all come to the Lord, we thought, this is the peak. And it hasn't begun yet. <laughs> you know, you, can't, you can get tempted so and tested and, and brought down. And, and, uh, and just to find out, well, this is the beginning. Shadrach, Meshach, yeah, and Abednego, and Daniel, and so many others. But the testing, Philadelphia got a clean slate. Smyrna had to suffer for 10 days. What's the diff? I mean, and God, does, does God know if you're a borderline? Say, well, I'll test you, or maybe just leave you alone. Or, but everyone will be tested, and God's fairness and judgment is perfect, and ours is imperfect. But I, on all things in prayer and Bible study, blessed is the man who studies day and night, a fellowship, we can never get enough fellowship with each other, uh, evangelism, appreciate you, Rob, going out last night, Javi and Daniel and everyone who goes out, and just always do that when we work. And fellowship, of course, and breaking of the uh, bread. And today we may have feet washing. You know, the German Baptists, they, uh, they look at feet washing as being a, uh, an act of continual cleansing. However they get that, I, maybe they're, they're way over my head, but an act of continual cleansing. As Peter said, uh, Jesus said to Peter, those who are clean, how do you say, you know, need to this, but you, you just wash only. They, they have a kind of an ironic view, not ironic, a... a uh, different view on feet washing than any other group I've ever heard of, but maybe they're right. But uh, anyway, thanks, Brother Walter. Lord be magnified. Um, thank you, everybody. And yeah, I've been, what I've been going through lately is, is how the Lord teaches us and how we hearken unto Him. Like the fruits of the Spirit, love, peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And, you know, like things that work, I want to 
check the phone often to see what time it is for lunch. So, but little voice going in my head, patient, just be patient, don't worry. Or things at work when I just, I want, I want to speak up. And temperance, self-control, you know, meekness, hum, be humble. So we should always hearken to how the Lord can teach us. Like you said, he chastises the ones he loves. And sometimes I feel when I'm being chastised, I, I feel like, man. You know, and I, Aaron showed me this thing on Facebook this guy was writing. He said, don't confuse chastisement with abandonment. And, you know, that's how Satan will work. Sometimes I, I felt that often, like, oh, the Lord abandons. But no, he, he chastises us. He teaches us. And that's why in the church there's teachers. Those who teach, you know, we need to be teaching the truth and truthful things. You know, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Let all things be done under edification. So I feel like the Lord, you know, he, he teaches us things. Love and peace, joy, long-suffering gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. I praise the Lord for changing my life and be with you guys, brothers and sisters. You guys are a blessing and just praise the Lord. I thought I was sharing this um, letter from Roswell, Nicaragua, from Nicaragua, um, I'm not going to read all of it, but um, just a little insight on um, how things work out. Um, coronavirus hits Roswell. Believe it or not, it's true. COVID-19 smashed through the city of Roswell four weeks ago and since. It surged through our churches like some vicious storm. But I'm here to testify that God saw us through and that we are alive and well. How do we know, how do we know that we had coronavirus? No, not because we got tested. There's no way of getting tested in Roswella. But after seeing how extremely contagious the bug was and how the symptoms, though somewhat diverse, all pointed toward COVID-19, it became increasingly clear. I would say that since there is little done to prevent getting infected in Roswell, over 90% of the adults in our church got sick. And I would, I would guess 90% of everyone else did too. But the good news is that for most of us, it wasn't worse than just a bad cold. I was half sick for about three days. I slept a lot, swallowed pills like a chicken swallows corn. The local hospital had a list of recommended meds for the pandemic that was roaring through. An antibiotic, a parasite treatment, and they often included chloroquine, however you say that word. I never really stopped working. In other words, my wife and I never did actually get bad enough to stay in bed. We did suffer some unhandy symptoms for two weeks. The virus really does hang in for a long time and does not like to let its victims loose. But otherwise, our encounter with the virus was mild. Some of our brethren hardly found out that they had coronavirus since their symptoms were not severe. Most got achy and had a dry cough sore throat, rainy fever, had diarrhea, or were feeling tired, and most of us lost our smell. To the point that when someone got sick and someone said, is it coronavirus? We all answered, absolutely. I lost my smell and my taste. Even the local bank now makes a person identify smells before it lets you in its door. Yes, but yes, there was a group of our people that got hit harder. There were four brethren that got very sick. As we prayed and waited, we wondered if someone from among us would die. Then there's the names of all these four people that I find difficult to pronounce. So. All four of these were pretty sick for two weeks, but none got to the place where they would have needed a ventilator. During this time, no one wanted to go to the hospital. We were hearing stories how other parts of Nicaragua people were dying. And when they hit the hospital, they were not able to see their family again. They got 
quick lonely burials, and that is almost more than Nicaraguans can bear. We have heard of several deaths here in Rothwella, but really the percentage was extremely low. I guess I figure that these people are just plain too tough to die. Even though people fought for their lives and made it. So the main thing I have to say today is that we praise God, praise the Lord for deliverance for his people in this place. Then it goes on to say how happy it is to be together. And then just several words of advice for you that have gov governments that help you prevent or prolong getting this disease. Do not bow to the demon of fear. This is this would be what stands out to me that in all these things we do not need to bow down in fear to anything. Um, so that would also that's just there's just so many so much talk and fear and and it can creep among us if if we allow it to it's um Don't bow to the demon of fear. He got 2 Timothy 1 7. God already knows how hard you will get it and will and will be there with you 24 7. And though I believe everyone will be exposed to it at one time or another, as I told the ones that were really sick, God knows when your time is to go home. So all you need to do is be ready. If one of your number gets called home, bless the Lord that carries the keys of death and hades. Please don't get political. The devil has turned this pandemic into an awful political mess. It is sick that you can hardly believe anyone because so many are using it for their political gain. Brethren, to me it's very sad when people, God's people stoop to do that. Pray that God pray that God do with the coronavirus what he wants among the nations. But focus on you what he wants to do in you. Anyway, there's There's more, but um, I thought I'd at least share that. And I guess, as far as I'm concerned, anybody can read it, the whole thing.